So before I got married, I lived in a house with seven other guys. I loved it. The place was always packed and I was never bored. So one winter we noticed our house was extremely cold. For some reason, our heating wasn't working. So the problem with living in a house full of single guys is no one wants to deal with any of the problems. You just hope that somebody else looks after it. We thought that we'd forgotten to pay the heating bill, but no one wanted to pay it. So for weeks, we just put up with the cold. It got so bad that we started sleeping with extra blankets and toques on just to keep warm. You know your house is cold when you can see your own breath. We'd even avoid having showers in the morning because it was so freezing. We couldn't take it any longer. It was way too cold. So we decided we need to call the heating company and deal with this right now. So we got on the phone and said, how much do we owe you? And can you please turn our heat back on? We were surprised when they told us that we didn't owe them anything. And that on their end, everything was working fine. But before we hung up the phone, they asked us one simple question. Have you checked your pilot light? Now the pilot light's a little flame in the furnace that stays on all the time. If you want to get heat, you need a flame so the gas can catch fire. It's very simple to turn on. It's just one button. The problem wasn't with the gas. We just had no pilot light. It's hard to swallow the fact that we went without heat for almost three months because of one button. Pilot light is a great picture of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I have a gas fireplace at home. It's great. The little flame of the pilot light stays lit all the time. But when I flip a switch, the gas is released and it bursts into a full fire. Like a pilot light, the Holy Spirit lives within the hearts of every Christian. But not every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is like turning on the gas. And He fills our hearts in an amazing life-giving way. A pastor called Francis Chan wrote a book all about the Holy Spirit. And in it, he writes this, Christians can't ever lose the Spirit, but his filling is something we should constantly pursue. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, his power, his presence, and his love are released into every part of our life. In Acts 8, we read of a leader in the early church named Philip, who was visiting the city of Samaria and spreading the good news about Jesus. Many people believed and became Christians and were baptized. Now when the church in Jerusalem heard about it, they sent Peter and John, the elders, down to visit them. When Peter and John arrived, they placed their hands on them, and they prayed for them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now something noticeable must have happened, because there's a guy there named Simon who went up to the apostles, and he asked them if he could buy off them the power to lay hands on people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter was furious, because Peter knew that the Holy Spirit is not for sale. It's not something you can buy, it's a gift from God. And God desires that all of his followers would receive that gift and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Merci. The phrase, be filled, actually captures the idea of something that's continual. In other words, in this verse, being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time deal. It's similar to the command to love one another. Loving one another isn't the type of thing you check off a list and say, well, I'm done, I loved, it's over. Imagine I help carry a friend's books to class or I share my lunch with someone or I hold the door open for an elderly lady and then I say, I've loved my neighbor, don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, because the command to love your neighbor is not a one-time thing, but it's something we do continually. And in the same way, we need to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Francis Chan says, the crux of it, I believe, is being filled with the Spirit is not a one-time act. Being filled with the Spirit is not limited to the day we first met Christ. Instead, throughout Scripture, we read of a relationship that calls us into an active pursuit of the Spirit. We see in Acts 2, the first Christians are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then in the fourth chapter of Acts, the same people are filled again. 
Sometimes people get tripped up wondering, am I filled with the Holy Spirit or not? Or they look around and wonder, is that person filled with the Holy Spirit? But this way of thinking misses the point entirely. When I hear about all the Holy Spirit does, I get a deep desire in my heart for more of God. I want all that God has for me. We're inviting you to ask God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. And it could be the first time like the people in Samaria, or maybe you're praying for the fifth or fiftieth time that God would continue to fill you. Each of us should have a posture of the heart that says, I want all that God has for me. In this session of Alpha, we want to pray and ask God's Holy Spirit to fill each one of us. In a few minutes, you'll be invited as a group to take some time to pray and wait on God. When the Holy Spirit showed up in power on the day of Pentecost, and in every other time in the book of Acts, the people around them noticed right away. For each person that was filled, there's some sort of notable response, something that others could notice. My aunt and uncle used to have a farm. They had horses and chickens and everything. And one of the favorite things that they had was an electric fence. My brothers and I used to go out there all the time to visit. And I remember one night, we're hanging outside and my uncle pulled out his knife from his pocket and he started poking the wires on the fence to make sparks. And it was really fun, at least until he got shocked and the knife shot out of his hand and started spinning towards my neck and hit me right in the jugular. Now fortunately, I got hit with the handle and not the blade, so I'm totally okay. I've noticed that when people get shocked, each person reacts differently. When I get shocked, I try to keep it quiet, holding the pain, grab my hand and just walk it off. Then on the other hand, when he gets shocked, everyone around is going to know. It's going to be loud, he'll be jumping and probably dancing around like a peacock. Even though it's the same power going through us, the response is really different. And in a similar way, when we experience the power of the Holy Spirit, the response will be different for each person. Now some people experience the power and love of God in a way that they can feel in their bodies. Warmth, tingling, nearness, speaking in tongues, weak legs, a weightiness of love and goodness, or trembling. It's simply our human bodies and emotions responding to the out of this world love and power of God. As you pray after this session, you might not experience this, and that's okay. Yeah, we want to describe these things to you so you wouldn't be surprised or confused if you do. It's really important to know that we're not chasing these experiences. And we don't base our relationship with God on how much we feel Him. Our faith is in God's promises, in His Word, and the work of Jesus on the cross. As you pray, don't chase the experience. Instead, chase God Himself. When we read about moments when people are filled with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, they often respond by speaking in other languages. The Bible calls this speaking in tongues. And we see it happening throughout church history and around the world today. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 that he desires that everyone would speak in tongues. Paul also goes on to say that not all Christians do, and that there are other spiritual gifts that we should desire even more. In Acts chapter 2 and again in Acts chapter 10, it describes how believers praise God in languages they didn't even know when they were filled with His Holy Spirit. One of the most common places for speaking in tongues is personal prayer. There are many moments in our lives when we just don't know what to pray. And that's why we need God's help. In those moments, the Holy Spirit can help us with words that our minds may not even understand. One night my sister Tara had some girls over for a Bible study. They spent some time in worship, singing songs together while Tara played the piano. As they were worshiping, the Holy Spirit began to fill the room with a sense of His love and nearness. As they continued to sing and pray, they began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. It reminds me of the day of Pentecost. The girls began to cry with tears of joy as they experienced a deep sense of God's love and presence. When we're filled with God's Spirit, there can be a distinct emotional response. It's normal to get emotional when we watch a sad movie or read a love story or watch sports. We can't always control our emotions. I don't know if you've ever been to a sports game with a huge crowd. People cheering for their team get emotional, shouting and cheering. And if there's ever a close finish or a championship win, there's tears of joy. For many people, when God's Spirit touches their hearts, they experience an emotional response. Tears of relief or joy, a new feeling of passion for life, laughter, happiness, or a deep sense of being loved. Praise is the most natural response to the work of the Spirit in our life. As you pray, you may have a deep desire to worship and give thanks to God. It's definitely okay to express that. If you've ever been to a concert, you've likely seen people lifting their hands into the air as they get into it. You may see Christians lifting their hands as they sing and praise and worship. This is a simple sign of surrender and love for God. When we cheer on a sports team, we get excited. And when we praise God, it's okay to get excited too. It's an overflow from our hearts. Romans 15, 13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, 
so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a very real experience of the Holy Spirit that's like an overflowing of thankfulness and hope. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we experience a deep sense of gratitude for all that God has done. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, God also gives us a boldness and passion to tell others about Him. In Acts chapter 4, we read about how the disciples prayed and were filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a result, they went out and spoke about God boldly, in spite of threats from the authorities. I love what Pope Francis said. We have the firm certainty that the Holy Spirit gives the church His mighty breath, the courage to persevere to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. In the letter to the Romans, chapter five, verse five, it says this, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. In another translation of the same passage, it says that God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. As Christ's love fills our heart, the crippling fear of what others might think or say is replaced with confidence and love. For a friend of mine, He experienced a deep love for everyone around him and even himself. He explained that before that, he'd felt hate in his heart. What an incredible change. Here's what Jesus says about praying to receive the Holy Spirit. In Luke 11, verses 9 to 13, he says this, And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is one of the best passages to look at before we pray, because many people wonder if there's anything that will stop them from being filled with the Spirit. God doesn't want anything to hold us back. Yeah, we don't have to doubt whether or not God wants to give us his Holy Spirit. Listen to the way that Jesus responds to that doubt. If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Just as a parent gives good gifts to their children, God wants to give us his Spirit. We can confidently expect that God will answer us when we ask. One thing that might cause us to hesitate in asking is fear fear of the unknown, or maybe even a fear that if we ask for the Holy Spirit, we may end up with something we don't want. But again, look at what Jesus says. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. If we ask for the Holy Spirit, God's not going to give us something hurtful. Everything the Holy Spirit has for us is good. I think one of the main things that held me back from asking for the Holy Spirit was a sense of unworthiness. I thought the Holy Spirit's for like pastors and priests, people who haven't made mistakes or sinned like I have or been a Christian for longer. But that type of thinking is backwards. Jesus reminds us that God's our Heavenly Father and He loves us. He wants to give us good gifts, not because of whether we've been good or not, but because He's our Heavenly Father. God wants to pour out His Spirit on all people, on men and women, old and young, rich and poor, and even you and me. So let's ask.